Fighting in Sudan is once again intensifying. Several ceasefires have failed to stop the bloodshed and the conflict has spread beyond Khartoum. So what more can be done to bring peace, especially by outside powers with influence? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Fully Batibo. It's been more than two months now since the lives of millions of people across Sudan plunged into war and uncertainty. The fighting between the army and paramilitary rapid support forces has intensified. A number of ceasefire deals agreed at talks led by the United States and Saudi Arabia have failed to stick. People are desperate. Many have run out of the basic necessities. The conflict has displaced more than two million people and neighboring countries like Chad are struggling to cope with the influx of refugees. So what's standing in the way of a long-term ceasefire and what more can outside powers do to convince the warring sides to put down their weapons? We'll put these questions to our guests in just a moment, but first, Nihad Alibedi has this update. Houses in Sudan's capital, Khartoum, shake because of the relentless fighting. The paramilitary rapid support forces say they have seized the headquarters of a heavily armed police unit. It's forced families in the area to stay indoors while they face shortages of essential supplies. We hope that this war will stop. People have been severely hurt as a result of this war. Some have been displaced and some are standing on the borders. We hope to God that this war will be stopped. The conflict between Army Chief Abdel Fattah al-Burhan and his former deputy RSF commander Mohammed Hamdan Dagalo has resulted in the death of at least 2,000 people since mid-April. That's according to the United Nations. The U.S. and Saudi Arabia have been mediating for several weeks, but numerous ceasefires have come and gone. None has stopped the fighting. That's despite commitments from both sides to ensure access to aid. Before April 15, 2023, the number of people in need of humanitarian aid was at 15.8 million, including 3.7 million internally displaced persons. This number rose to 24.7 million people, including more than 18 million in need of urgent humanitarian aid. This is a 57 percent increase compared to the levels before the conflict. The violence has spread to the western Darfur region, the other major battleground. Its largest city, Nyala, has experienced intense fighting, leading to a surge in refugees and casualties. UN officials have warned of possible crimes against humanity and the conflict's ethnic dimension in Darfur. The International Organization for Migration says more than 150,000 people have fled to neighboring Chad from Darfur. The Chadian Prime Minister is appealing for substantial financial and technical support. But with each passing day, the pursuit of lasting peace in Sudan seems to slip away further. Nihar al for Inside Story. Well, so far, there have been more than 16 ceasefires, with a majority being brokered by the U.S. and Saudi Arabia. The most recent one lasted three days and ended on June 21st, with heavy fighting resuming within minutes. A few days prior to that, the warring sides had agreed to another 72-hour ceasefire after an air raid in Khartoum killed 17 people. And on June 9th, a 24-hour ceasefire was declared to facilitate the delivery of humanitarian aid African leaders were also involved in efforts to ease the suffering, but the conversations failed to deliver any meaningful results. Well, let's welcome our guests for today's Inside Story. In Berlin, Holod Chai, founding director at Confluence Advisory, a think tank previously based in Khartoum. In Cairo, Egypt, Hamid Khalafala, Sudan policy researcher. His work focuses on constitution building in Sudan. And in London, Dalia Abdelmoniem, political commentator and former journalist. A warm welcome to all three of you. Thank you very much for joining us on Inside Story. I know that you all left Sudan recently. 
Hamid, let me start with you. You left Khartoum just a few weeks ago and the fighting has intensified since the last ceasefire deal ended. What is your assessment first as to who has the upper hand? Which side has the edge right now? Uh, it's, it's very hard to, to, to decide who has the upper hand, uh, particularly in Khartoum, where most of the fighting uh, is focused, uh, fighting in other areas, uh, particularly that four takes a different shape. Uh, but if we're speaking about Khartoum, uh, you know, it, it, it keeps on changing. Uh, but the reality is that on ground, the Iraqi support forces, uh, paramilitary, do have more uh, ground troops than the uh, Sudan, mm -hmm. the, the military, the Sudanese armed forces. Uh, so if, if we look at, uh, look at it from that side, uh, there are a lot of reports that suggest that uh, the RSF, uh, you know, is more visible uh, in different right. neighborhoods but, uh, around Khartoum. But the army, Hamid, has the air power. The RSF doesn't have air power. How do you explain that they've been able to hold off and hold on for so long? The paramilitary rapid support forces do have quite advanced uh, anti-aircraft uh, that they have got from regional countries uh, and, and, and so on. So Which that countries? has been quite... Uh, well, uh, specifically the United Arab Emirates and, and, and other allies uh, that, that we know the Iraq support forces do have uh, with, with the Wagner Group, for instance, in Russia and the Emirates, as I mentioned, uh, mm -hmm. and so on. Uh, so they do get that kind of support and they have these advanced anti-aircraft that have been, to some extent, obviously efficient. Uh, they have made reports of, uh, of them uh, shooting multiple uh, jet fighters uh, of the army. Then the other thing is that, you know, in urban fights, when, when in urban wars, when uh, in the heart of cities and so on, when the other party does not have ground forces, it mm -hmm. kind of, it, it, weak, it weakens them and works at the disadvantage. Uh, there okay. is so much that air, air, air force can do. Okay. You talked about the fighting in uh, Sudan, uh, the western region of Darfur, and I'll come back to that in a moment, uh, Hamid, and, and ask you more about the significance of that. But I want to ask Dahlia first about what you've been hearing, uh, Dahlia, for the from the people you've been speaking to uh, about the situation in Khartoum. What's the sentiment on the ground from those who've stayed behind in Sudan, from those who couldn't afford to leave? Do they feel abandoned? Um... It's not just the issue of abandonment. A lot of those who have who have been forced to stay behind in Khartoum, they say there's an there's an uptake, there's a hike in looting and vandalism. And actually, you know, from the RSF, whenever there's a ceasefire, you know, you know, so that's also a worry for a lot of people because there's nowhere for them to leave. And they, a lot of them are forced to evacuate their homes, are forced to, you know, surrender or to just give in to the RSF and their atrocities. But there's been an uptake in the number of rape cases. I've been hearing there's a, you know, there's a large number of rape violations taking place. People being, uh, you know, also the, atta the attacks from the air, from the army has also, like you mentioned in the beginning of this um, show, 17 people were killed from an airstrike. So the, the issue of abandonment, I think that was, set in, in stone from day one mm -hmm. because then every day the situation keeps getting worse if even those who are still trying to get out you know borders are closing in our faces or if they're still open there's a lot of you know legis legislation that needs to be in place before we can cross over so that sense of being abandoned has always been there it's not something new it's just been it's, it's been cemented the longer this conflict goes on mm -hmm. the more we we're more uh, you know, we're more convinced that it has to come from us, from inside Sudan, and from the, and, you know, for, for there to be any chance of this war ending, because the ceasefires are not working. Right. The negotiation the ceasefire, seems to, seem to be failing. The ceasefires are not working, and I'll ask you a bit more about why, why diplomacy hasn't worked in just a minute. But I want to bring in Holod into the conversation. Holod, as we've said, there's now fighting also in Darfur, in the Darfur region of Sudan. Uh, in Nyala, the largest city in Darfur, in El Janaina, where many people have fled from and headed to uh, Chad. How concerning is it that the fighting is no longer just confined to Khartoum? Is this now an all-out civil war? It's getting there. I think it's not a surprise that 
war prone play areas and areas where there has been significant conflict over the past few years, even if those conflicts have gone into some level of dormancy, have seen those conflicts reignite. And it's not just Darfur, it's also South Kordofan and Blue Nile, where we have seen clashes between the Sudan Armed Forces and the Rapid Support Forces, as well as groups already in those areas. Now, in Darfur, I think it's gone beyond just a conflict. It is uh, the, this conflict now between the two uh, forces have brought to life back some of the, um, the existing conflicts there and have actually precipitated mass atrocities and some would say genocide. And that's because there's, there's a settling of old scores that's going on now, particularly in Darfur, under the guise of this current uh, war. But what's quite clear is that though both sides have encouraged, particularly the RSF, have encouraged a lot of the fighting in Darfur, um, they're not really in control of it. And so to what extent that fighting can now be uh, minimized remains to be seen. But certainly we're going to see this war become far more, mm. um, to proliferate far more than before it ceases. Hamid, your thoughts about what's happening in Darfur? Of course, it's not just Darfur. As uh, uh, Holod mentioned, it's also South Kordofan, Khartoum, of course. But what, why is Darfur significant to these two generals? Sorry, uh, that's, that's a very good question. Uh, Darfur is a very important uh, kind of uh, region for, for, both, for both actors. Uh, obviously, uh, there is the sensitivity and the fragility of the region, uh, which has suffered uh, of conflict for over 10, 20 years uh, now. Uh, but why, it's why is it important for both actors? Uh, for the paramilitary RSF, uh, this is basically their base, uh, if you like. This is where most of uh, you know, the militia and the troops and, and so on, uh, most of the tribes that they recruit men from and so on, are in Darfur, uh, particularly Arab tribes, uh, mm. Arab Darfurian tribes, and then they extend it to include others, but mostly uh, from that region. And this is where their constituency, uh, it's not constituency in, in that sense, but it's where they their roots are, uh, right. if you like. Uh, and also the borders. It's uh, Darfur borders Libya, Chad, and uh, Central African Republic. All three countries are important countries for uh, General Himeti and the Rapid Support Forces in terms of, you know, support and arms supply and so on through uh, Haftar in Libya or mm. uh, the Chadian opposition uh, in Chad and the uh, Wagner groups, mm. uh, group in, in, in Central African Republic. Uh, right. So for Himeti, that is a very strategic place and also where he would kind of go as a plan B if he fails to take over Khartoum and the whole okay. country. And you mentioned Wagner, Hamid. Let me just interrupt you there because you mentioned Wagner and I do want to talk about the recent events in Russia. What impact do you see this crisis and Wagner's uncertain future having on uh, the RSF and the support they've been getting from Wagner? Do, do you think this could have an impact on uh, the conflict in Sudan? I think from, 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 from where I sit, there might be a silver lining for us there with the events that are taking place uh, in Russia at the moment, that the Wagner group would, would be less uh, interested and less available uh, to support uh, the rapid support forces. Uh, and that would kind of uh, help in, 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 in pushing this war to an end sooner uh, and, and so on. So, in, yeah, in that sense, I think that that, that, could, be, that could, be, could have a positive impact on the conflict in Sudan. Okay, Dalia, let me come to you now and ask you why diplomacy has failed. What's hindering uh, uh, the settlement to this conflict? Uh, well, I don't think either side is actually willing to, to negotiate or to even talk. Uh, I mean, their intent is not there for this conflict, for this war to end. And I think also, in my opinion, the fact that civic groups and the political parties, regardless of what we feel about them, are not even present during the talks is a huge setback because you need to involve all actors, all actors who have a say, who have a stake in this war. But when you just leave it to, the, to these two generals and their armies, mm. I mean, their intention for either side, they want to win at whatever right. cost. Both sides so, are digging in. Digging in. And, and I think also the tactics uh, used by the negotiating parties have been misplaced. Mm. And I think the recent statement from the United States says, says it all. You know, Molly McPhee said that they need to have a rethink, so to speak. And that was the mistake they did from since, since the days of the coup back in 2021. So I think it's, it's, it's a number of reasons, you know. So... But I think the end of the day, for me, the fact that neither side really are serious about 
the ceasefires are not mm -hmm. serious about ending this conflict. And it, to, as long as it goes as a somewhat forgotten conflict, forgotten war, they can pretty much get continue to get away with what they've been doing so far. Okay, Hulud, your thoughts about this? Is this heading towards a forgotten conflict? And Dalia says that the tactics used by uh, the negotiating parties, the U.S. and Saudi Arabia, have been misplaced. What are your thoughts about this? And why do you think diplomacy hasn't worked? I think it's timely that the Jeddah talks have been uh, paused. I, I don't think they uh, did anything to put Sudan into a path uh, towards any ceasefire. And in fact, um, the ceasefires were used by the generals and their institutions as a means to resupply and for the RSF to pillage homes and commit all sorts of human rights abuses. Um, so yes, uh, there, there absolutely does need to be a rethink. I think there needs to be a very deep rethink, which I'm not really seeing any prospects for. But mm. as the international community, which has been mediating has been largely trusting these generals um, and, and sort of wishing them to be reformers rather than seeing them as the bad will actors that they are. I'm hoping that in the next rounds of mediation can indeed reflect um, that recognition of, of exactly who they are. These are people who are not interested in civilian democracy. It goes against every single interest they have. They have been waging a war against democracy that has actually started a lot earlier earlier than this current war. And this war is in many ways a new brinkmanship um, that they have and to exact more concessions from pro-democracy actors, um, which may indeed uh, be the case. There is no military victory here. At some point, they will have to come to negotiating to the negotiating table. Mediators at that point, as well as Sudan civilians, need to be ready um, mm. with a setup that includes the civilians, gives them the, you know, the, the breadth that is required to include as many as possible, embraces the complexity and divisions of Sudan's uh, democratic actors and pushes for an entirely new vision for Sudan. Right. Hamid, your thoughts? The, the Saudis and the Americans have failed so far in bringing the two sides to reach a settlement, but there are a lot of other would-be mediators in this conflict, the UN, EU, Egypt, for example, some of the Gulf countries, the African Union, IGAD as well. Who has the better leverage, in your view, who stands a chance at stopping the fighting and getting the generals to stop fighting? I think the only, the only way forward is a coordinated and a unified mechanism. One of the issues that we have, you know, uh, been seeing is the competition between these different initiatives, uh, which kind of gives the, the generals excuses uh, to get out of the talks, to delay and, and to procrastinate. Uh, so that competition has been very uh, harmful. And I think it, 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 it needs to come to a point where, where we need a coordinated and a unified mechanism. Each what sort of mechanism? Is it, is, it, is, it, is it uh, sanctions? What sort of mechanisms? Because, or is it financial incentives? Obviously, a, comp a comprehensive package that includes a political process uh, with clear agenda and, as Hulud said, with civilians at the heart of it and, and, and deciding the agenda for it and so on. And then other actors with leverage and power to come with incentives, but also, you know, consequences for not uh, being part of the process and not following through. Uh, different actors that are part of the process or could be part of the process uh, have different uh, things to offer. Uh, there are regional uh, actors like Saudi, like uh, the Emirates, uh, like Egypt and so on, who have direct, uh, you know, uh, alliances and relations with, with the warring factions, and they could use these relations to leverage that. And without them, I think the process would not uh, work well. Then you have Western governments uh, and institutions that are a bit more pro-democracy, who would be able to pressure uh, and, and to make sure that the, the democratization agenda and the peace uh, making and so on uh, are, are addressed uh, correctly and so on, but could yeah. also come with, with their own leverage, as you mentioned, sanctions and economic uh, kind of implications. Okay. Dalia, your thoughts. Which outside power do you think has the leverage today and, and get some response from the rival Sudanese parties to stop this conflict? I think if they wanted to, the UAE, they have influence on both sides and they can easily why play a much bigger role. Why do you think they don't role. want to? Uh, why? Why not? I, I honestly don't. I think it's. I think they're hedging their bets. This is my personal opinion. I think they're hedging their bets. Who, whichever side emerges victorious, is a benefit. Is a benefit to them. I think Egypt has been sidelined, as in to have a role or to have a say. I think also economically, what what Egypt is going through is playing a part in them being somewhat to the side. 
But most definitely, I think the Gulf regions, the Gulf countries, especially Saudi Arabia and the UAE, can have a bigger role, mm -hmm. can do more if they so would want to. But why they don't want to, I I can't guess from my, I mean, I can't, I don't see, I don't know why, but right. I'm just, for me, it's, they're hedging their bets. Okay, Holo, do your thoughts about this. Why wouldn't the UAE push harder, pressure more? I think, you know, this works on several levels. On one level, they are concerned about the Islamist threat within the Sudan Armed Forces, but that, of course, um, is in many ways a sort of red herring because Islamists exist across the, the, the Sudanese political landscape, including within the RSF as well. I think the RSF have most likely made guarantees to the UAE um, and other backers. Um, in the event they win, they would be able to make good on those promises. And the same goes for the Sudan Armed Forces. And as long as the two main belligerents and their international backers um, do not uh, recognize that this conflict will not end in a military victory, they will continue to push for that military victory. And in the meantime, it is the people of Sudan who will continue to face the brunt of that. And so the quicker these all these sides, including the international actors, get to a negotiating table with the genuine willingness to negotiate, the better it will be. But as I said before, those negotiations cannot prioritize military actors. They must prioritize civilian actors and, and sort of put accountability front and center. Hamid, your thoughts. Uh, Sorry. Yes, go, go ahead, uh, go ahead, uh, Dahlia. Add something and then I'll come to I Hamid. I mean, uh, just uh, continuing on from what Khalud was saying, I don't think any of the regional actors would like to have the civilian parties at the heart and center of it because that will add pressure to the on them and it doesn't come it doesn't play into their hands that to have a country that where is there's a civilian government rule so to speak and in their own countries they there are autocratic regimes in power so it's so it's just what works for us is to the disadvantage of others and they're the ones who can pull the strings so to speak and so mm -hmm. i don't think they will be willing or wanting to push forward the whole civilian aspect as an uh -huh. end to this I war mean Hamid, you, your thoughts about this, about the civilian aspect of this, and is there a, figu a civilian figurehead today that could be involved in these negotiations? I think there are two sides to this. A, uh, the problem uh, or, or, of the mediators and how the U.S. Saudi, for instance, uh, initiative and the Jeddah platform has completely sidelined uh, civilians, uh, but also all other initiatives so far they have not engaged uh, civilians in the right way. So there is that issue. The other issue is from the civilian side as well. I think there, there needs to be a more clear, uh, you know, ask or, or, or agenda from, from civilian sides on terms of how they see the process, how they see things moving forward and how the war would end. There has been a, a no-to-war uh, kind of platform or campaign that was established uh, a few, a uh, couple of uh, days or a week after the war erupted back in April, but mm -hmm. that has not kind of evolved and developed its, its uh, you know, perspectives and vision in a more detailed way that could be uh, taken on board. So I think there's that gap in that side as well that needs to be filled as soon as possible. Understandably, the war kind of limits uh, people's ability to convene and discuss, but I think by now we have established some ways of communication that should help us uh, put that kind of... Uh, you know, uh, proposal forward. Yeah. Khulud, your thoughts about this? I saw you wanted to jump in when I asked a, a qu the question about whether there was a civilian figurehead today that could be involved in uh, negotiations. Uh, no, and then there shouldn't be. This is a collective movement. It does not rely on individuals. Mm -hmm. um, when it has relied on individuals, um, it, has it hasn't worked out. And so I think we shouldn't try and keep flogging that dead horse. I think there should be um, a, a mechanism that much more represents the collective nature of the Sudan pro-democracy movement and is therefore able to absorb the differing um, political perspectives that, that, that exist. Because that's the only way that you're going to get um, a movement uh, that, that, that then translates into um, representation. In, in other words, you cannot have a person represent the entire breadth of the pro 
pro-democracy movement, it's much better to have a common agenda or a common vision. Now, is there a platform that can currently do that? No. The, the, mo the, the closest one, I guess, would be the AU de-escalation platform, because within mm. that, a central tenet is civilian um, engagement. But there has been very little movement on that, and they right. need very high-level uh, task force to be able to put that into motion. You mentioned the AU. I was going to ask you about, you know, African leaders and, and African initiatives as well. EGAD, the East African Regional Bloc, how involved has it been? And can that yield any positive outcomes, especially when you consider that a collapse of Sudan would affect that entire region? Well, absolutely. It is incumbent upon EGAD and the African Union to pay close attention to this, because they will be the ones to feel it for the, the impact of state collapse first. Now, we have seen some movements from particularly Kenya within, the, within EGAD, but a lot of the overtures coming out of both EGAD and the African Union have a lot more to do with the personal ambitions of member states rather than Sudan's um, future. And I think once that is, has been reconfigured, and actually Sudan's future is right front and center of a mediation approach, then we will be able to see not just a better and faster response to what's going on in Sudan, but also a lot more complementarity between EGAD and the African Union, and as well, of course, the United Nations and other international actors. We haven't seen that yet. And time is, you know, um, is absolutely of the essence. So these institutions need to put aside uh, personal interests of member states and put Sudan front and center. Time is running out. Dahlia, I'll come to you for the uh, final word. What are the prospects today for peace in Sudan? When you speak to people who are still back home, how hopeful are they that this could end soon? Um, they're very, I wouldn't say fatalistic, but they have, they put, they place higher hopes on intervention from the, from, from God than from any other side coming in. They see no let up. I mean, we're lucky, the three of us, me, Hamid and Khulud, we're lucky we all managed to get out. But those who are still there, there's no one helping them. The, the humanitarian situation is getting worse. And it's, um, I mean, when I speak to people, they're just very, you know, fate accompli. This is what it is. And they've, like, in a way, accepted their fate. Have they given which up? Is really disheartening. Not given up, but they're just like, whatever, you know. This is, it, it is what it is. We're here. No help is coming. There's no sign of a let up from the from the conflict. You know, you keep hearing stories and, you know, it's getting closer and closer to home to those who are being affected, you know. And so it's it's hard. It's it's easy for me to speak from from being outside. But those who are still there, I. I they're like, you know, I mean, I can't even express it properly. Mm. They've. In a way, yeah, they have given up, but they've put their faith in God and they're hoping that something will happen soon and there's a breakthrough or a miracle, but I don't think they have much belief in that, but it's, 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 it's helping them. Okay. It's, it's Thank consoling you. them. Thank you so much for sharing your views, your experiences with us, all three of you, Hamid Khalafala, Khulud Khair, Dalia Abdel Moniem. Thank you so much for joining us on Inside Story. And thank you, too, for watching. You can always watch this program again anytime by visiting our website at aljazeera.com. For further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And, of course, you can join the conversation on Twitter. The handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Fuliba Tibo, and the whole team here in Doha, thanks for watching. Bye for now.